Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the IP Lunch Club. My name is Mackenzie, and I'm one of the 16 members of the Sandbox Center. For those who may not be acquainted with SBX, we're located online in downtown Barrie, and we connect people and their ideas to business resources so that they can create a better life through business. We're thrilled to once again continuing our partnership with IP Osgood's IP Innovation Clinic. Protecting the ideas and creations of artists, inventors, and business owners allows businesses to grow and encourages innovation. So for those who may not be acquainted with IP Osgood, may not have attended last week's first kickoff session or even uh, past sessions in the space itself, IP Osgood is an innovation to market legal clinic staffed by law students and operated in collaboration with York University's Innovation York, Norton Rose, Fulbright LLP, and the International Law Research Program at the Center for International Governance Innovation. It serves a clientele that is needs-based and underserviced such as individuals or startup companies who do not have the resources to hire a lawyer, patent agent, or other advisors. Under the guidance and mentorship of other supervising lawyers, Innovation Clinic Fellows provide one-to-one -one legal information services to inventors, entrepreneurs, and startup companies to assist with the innovation and commercialization processes. The partnership we hold is so incredibly unique to be able to provide the opportunity for students to have hands-on experience supporting businesses and then similarly for businesses to have access to this expertise. It's just such a win-win. So before I continue with introducing the IP Osgood team for today's session, we're extremely grateful to have Barristan Law join us for this series as a presenting sponsor. The team at Barristan are not only, not only an active and committed contributor to SBX regularly, but continue to serve the local region when it comes to protecting business owners and improving innovation. So I'd like to introduce Alexander Paul today of Barristan Law to share a few words. Thanks for joining us today, Alex. Thank you. My name is Alexandra Paul. I'm an articling student at Barristan Law. We have offices in Barrie, Collingwood, Huntsville, and Bracebridge. Um, we're a mid-sized full-service firm covering everything from family, civil litigation, real estate, estates, IP. The list is endless. Um, and this particular uh, lunch and learn, I think, is so important, especially in a community like Barrie and with the partnership with Sandbox. So many small businesses don't pay attention to their IP protection, and it's such a timely aspect of starting your business. Um, it's so beneficial to new entrepreneurs to take steps to establish when establishing their business, implementing new product ideas, obtaining licenses, and that kind of thing. Um, the basic understanding of various IP types and procedures and having awareness of the differences will only help your business succeed. And I think this particular lunch and learn is so important for everyone that is just thinking about starting their new business. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you for the remarks. Uh, we super appreciate Barristan Law for sponsoring this series. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Today, in part two of the IP Lunch Club, the IP Osgood team will be guiding us through three main ways in which entrepreneurs can profit from their innovative ideas and highlighting each process along the way. So if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to use the Q&A feature or chat. We'll make sure to address them at the end. Um, we are recording this session. So if you and uh, attendees will be able to have access to this as a resource afterwards, so no worries. Um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Emma of the IP Osgood team to get us started. Over to you, Emma. Hi there, thank you, Mackenzie. Um, once again, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us at the IP Lunch Club. My name is Emma Abbas and I'm an aspiring IP lawyer and a student at law at the IP Innovation Clinic. Uh, Mackenzie has given you a wonderful introduction to the amazing work the clinic does. Um, I'm coordinating today's session on behalf of the clinic. These students have worked hard to bring these informative presentations to you. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at the IP Innovation Clinic. Uh, this is a second of the five part series and we would encourage you to come back and join us for the rest of the lunches as well. Uh, these are weekly lunches held every Wednesday. Uh, we would be grateful if you can also fill out the survey, which will go out at the end of the five presentations, uh, that is after the five weeks. Uh, the information is available for contacting us, uh, you know, in the materials which will be sent out to you by email. Uh, the clinic especially wants to support the underrepresented communities, 
uh, in Canada and highlight the creative intellect and talent these communities have to offer. So without further ado, please welcome David, Joaquin and Tanya. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction, Emma. So today uh, we're gonna be talking about effective strategies for IP commercialization and success. Uh, so as Emma mentioned, I'm Joaquin Arias and alongside my colleagues, David Park and Tanya Tawakli, we're going to give you an overview of the most effective IP commercialization strategies. So your first question might be, why does IP commercialization matter? And the answer is that intangible assets, a category dominated by IP, has grown dramatically since the 1970s to make up the vast majority of all assets in the global market. This trend only seems to be intensifying and going forward, the world economy is going to be driven primarily through the commercialization of ideas. So for this presentation, we broke down the principal IP commercialization strategies into three broad categories. I will be explaining how to build a business around IP. Tanya will be discussing IP licensing and franchising. And finally, David will be discussing the sale of IP. So assuming that you have an idea that you might think will make you some money, what's next? The first and most apparent way to commercialize your idea is by building a business around it. And the first thing you're going to want to do when building a business focused on IP is speaking with an IP lawyer in order to understand your legal rights and liabilities. It doesn't make sense to invest a lot of money and time building a business which is based on an idea that is either unpatentable or might actually infringe on others' IP rights and could become a liability for you. The unfortunate news is that filling a provisional patent is expensive. On average, you're looking at spending between $1,500 and $3,500. The good news is that if you're a Canadian entrepreneur, you can take advantage of Osgood's, Osgood Hall's Law School Pro Bono IP Innovation Clinic, where law students can help give you an idea of the IP panorama surrounding your innovation and help highlight challenges that you may have if you would like to seek a patent for your innovation or a trademark for the logo or slogan of your business. And while the overview that pro bono clinics can give you is not strictly legal advice, it can give you a good idea of whether you should proceed with a patent lawyer. In the grand scheme of things, spending a couple thousand dollars making sure that the core of your business is protected is likely going to be the best investment you can make for your IP-based business. After, your pat after you patent your innovation, you're going to want to incorporate your business if you haven't done so by now. While well, technically you can run your business as a sole proprietorship or a partnership, 99% of the time you're going to want to incorporate. And there are two main reasons for this. First is that by incorporating, you avoid indefinite personal liability if your business is sued. And secondly, you can use the corporate model in order to raise money through the issuance of shares. And the good thing is that online incorporation of your business is not very expensive, costing $200 to federally register your business directly with the Canadian government. Alongside incorporating your business and protecting your IP, you're going to want to create a detailed business plan, which is first going to give you insight into the feasibility of your idea, and secondly, is going to be essential for the recruitment of capital, employees, and customers. Leading consulting firms, including McKinsey and Deloitte, recommend that your first business plan be around 10 to 20 pages, where you're going to be doing at least five things. First, you're going to be describing your business. Second, you're going to be outline the, a market strategy which defines the consumers that you're going to be targeting and explaining how you're going to be marketing to them. Third, you're going to carry out a competitive analysis where you evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the competitors in the market and ways you can run your business to have a distinct advantage over them. Fourth, outline the operations and management of your company by allocating responsibility throughout your team or defining which subcontractors you are going to be using. Five, define the financial factors by estimating how much it will cost you to run your business and how you're going to be funding that. And speaking of the financial factor, once you start operating your business, there are three main ways that you can fund it. The first and most common way is through a bank loan. So over the past 10 years, small businesses in Canada have received over $9.5 billion um, in asset-based financing, representing over 63,000 loans made. And whether you get a loan is primarily going to be based on the quality of your business plan. Now, if you don't want to be liable for a loan and, uh, and you are willing to uh, sell a percentage in your business, um, you can seek angel investors. 
So angel investors are individuals who provide capital for business startup, usually in exchange for ownership equity. Since a lot of startups fail, angel investors usually seek businesses with a potential of a 20 times or 30 times return over a five to seven year period. In your business plan, you're going to wanna to outline how you're going to be achieving this level of growth. According to the Business Development Bank of Canada, there are 20,000 to 50,000 angels in Canada. And you can reach out to these investors through organizations such as the National Angel Capital Organization. Now, if you don't wanna be partitioning part of your business and you don't wanna be liable for loan, you also still have the option of crowdfunding. Um, and so crowdfunding is raising small amounts of money from a large number of people, typically via the internet, using websites like kickstarter.com. Um, now through crowdfunding, you're presenting your idea to the public. And so if you have an IP based business, you're really going to want uh, to make sure that your IP is protected before you do that, since disclosing your idea to the public is likely going to make it impossible for you to protect your idea going forward. Okay. Now that you have an understanding of the basics of building an IP based business, I'll turn it over to Tanya, who will discuss licensing and franchising. Hi, everyone. Now that you have Joaquin's great advice on how to build a business around IP, I'm going to briefly talk about how to commercialize your IP through licensing and franchising. So what is licensing? Licensing is essentially an agreement whereby the licensor agrees to grant to the licensee uh, certain IP rights on agreed terms and conditions. An IP license is then essentially giving another person the right to use your intellectual property. There are several benefits of doing this. It allows the owner of the intellectual property to retain ownership, gain royalties, and expand to new markets. For the licensee, on the other hand, it allows them to save on R&D costs and venture into new business opportunities. With the rapid growth and development of science and technology, in reality, license, licensing often becomes a necessity, not just for small businesses, but even for large corporations. A startup or a university research center, for example, often license their products and inventions to big corporations to gain from their knowledge, expertise, and resources. A small business may lack the ability to market, distribute, test, or get approvals for their products. In some cases, they might even require to obtain a license from someone else to be able to develop their own business or IP. As each intellectual property right is unique, every licensing agreement is unique. Licensing involves not just the legal considerations, but also business and technical considerations. Therefore, it's critical to have a written agreement to clarify the scope of the license, the rights and obligations of those involved, and remedies in case of any dispute. This slide highlights some of the important clauses of an IP licensing agreement that parties should definitely discuss and negotiate in order to reach a mutually beneficial arrangement. I will now talk about franchising, which is also a popular method of IP commercialization. The franchisor is the one who owns the business concept, experience, and the brand, and the know-how. The franchisor allows the franchisee to adopt these aspects through a license agreement and for a fee. The goal of the franchisor is to geographically expand its business with lower risks and for the franchisee to benefit from the brand and experience of the franchisor. Therefore, it is essential for businesses that wish to adopt this model to consider its feasibility. The main question to ask is whether there, whether there is a successful business model and brand name that has worked in the past. In this arrangement, the franchisor retains control over the franchise and continuously provides assistance and support with resources, training, as well as transfer of knowledge. The franchisee puts in the initial capital, pays a license fee, and gets access to a proven system and process. It is obvious then to make sure that you choose the correct franchisee and provide adequate support. McDonald's, for example, has thousands of franchises all over the world. You will find similar products, services, look and feel, and methods of operations pretty much across all branches. 
even the slightest of deviations have the potential of uh, damaging the brand and so it's important to keep a track on the working of the franchise and conduct regular due diligence audits to account for any risks and requirements i will now pass it on to david to discuss sale and assignment thanks tanya i'm david and i'll be going over another method of commercializing your ip which is selling or assigning your ip to someone else so there are various reasons why you might want to sell your IP rather than license or franchise it. For example, you might have an IP asset that doesn't fit well with the rest of your IP portfolio, and it would make you more money if you just sold that part of your portfolio to someone else. You might have an urgent need for cash flow at the moment and want to just sell off that IP asset as soon as possible. Or you might dislike the idea of continuously enforcing your IP and maintaining third party obligations, which can be very time consuming and expensive. Uh, for example, patents require yearly maintenance fees, uh, which you might not want to pay if you're not making much use of your patent. But before you sell your IP, you should conduct a due diligence assessment. This assessment will identify the following. First, ownership rights. For example, you should verify that all employees that works with this IP signed an agreement to assign any of that IP to your company. Secondly, you should know the protection status of the IP. For example, is a patent still in force? Did you pay all the necessary fees to keep it in force? Also consider any existing third-party obligations. For example, any current uh, licensing agreements that um, are still in force and also consider ongoing or potential legal disputes. These are all points of information that a potential buyer would want to know and gives you an idea of exactly what you're selling. Um, I will get into this later, but patent brokers can conduct this uh, sort of due diligence assessment for you. But if you are doing it in-house, it's a good idea to involve people from different um, fields, for example, legal, technical, financial, marketing, et cetera, because they might have insight as to how the IP has been used and protected to this date. So when it comes to actually setting a dollar value to your IP, this can be a very complicated process and there's no standard method of doing it. But there are examples of uh, IP valuation methods that we will discuss here. Uh, those are the cost method, the market method and the income method. And just remember on the backdrop that IP rights are negative rights. You, it is only valuable insofar as you can prevent other people from using it. So no matter how great or disruptive your idea may be, if other people can use it, then it's not going to be very valuable to buyers. So let's get into the actual methods of IP valuation, starting with the cost method. So this method involves evaluating the cost to replace or recreate the IP. So for example, if the buyer decides not to buy from you and just create the same IP from scratch on their own, um, how much would that cost them? And this can be a baseline for how much you can value your IP. This can be a relatively simple method, which is an advantage, but there's a disadvantage that this method may oversimplify the value. For example, it may not take into account future uh, earnings growth potential. The next method is the market method. This uses a benchmark in the market. Um, so for example, if there was a similar IP asset sold in a similar circumstance, you could try to use that as a starting point uh, and make appropriate adjustments. The advantage of this method is that you're not starting from scratch but the disadvantage can be that it can be difficult to find comparable data. The next method is the income method. This involves looking at the income or cash flow that you expected to generate from your IP asset over its lifetime. The advantage of this method is that it helps prevent uh, selling at a loss, but the disadvantage is that this method involves a lot of subjective assumptions and you may get pushback from the buyer if they disagree with some of your valuation methods. So let's get into the different ways you can actually sell your IP. This is a non-exhaustive list, but these are two of the more common or streamlined 
ways you could go with. So these are patent auctions and patent brokers. So let's talk about patent auctions. Uh, there are many websites uh, which can list your IP assets and people can peruse that website and bid uh, for that asset. And also there are many firms which host patent auctions digitally or in firm. Uh, we list several websites or examples throughout these slides, uh, but just to make an important note here, we're not recommending these over any other services. Uh, these are just for examples. So just consider what your needs are when you're selecting a particular firm or website for, to auction off your IP. So for example, if you need a quick sale, uh, you might want to go with the firm that does uh, that run sealed bid auctions where people can't see what other people are bidding. So they just go all out on their first bid. Now let's talk about patent brokers. So these are independent third parties who are often IP experts and they act as matchmakers between sellers and buyers. Uh, they can facilitate sales in many different ways. They might market your IP asset for you. They may try to negotiate a fair market price for you. They might even conduct the IP evaluation or due diligence assessment on your behalf. Um, and they'll perform usually in a formative role, um, telling you about different operational considerations behind transactions involving IP. So different IP brokers try to market themselves in different ways. So some may specialize in particular fields. So if you, let's say, are trying to sell a tech IP asset, then you may want to look for a patent broker that specializes with technology. So now I'll pass it back to Tanya, who will discuss some Canadian success stories and lessons. Thanks, David. We're going to leave you with a snapshot of a few Canadian success stories. The three names that you see on your screen started out small in Canada, but now have grown exponentially, not just in Canada, but all across the world. Lululemon, for example, which started out as a small yoga and design studio in Vancouver, now has over 300 retail stores all over the world with over 2000 employees. Their IP portfolio is a mix of trademarks for their brand name, as well as patent and industrial designs for various aspects of, such as production materials, fabrics, and designs. The common thread between the names that you see here is that they paid attention to the value of their IP early on, which helped them to be where they are today. That's our presentation. Thank you so much for listening to us, and we will be happy to take up any questions. Thank you guys so much. That was an incredible presentation and I loved the real world examples that you provided at the end. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A, so I figured let's get those started. Um, the first question we have, uh, what remedies are available to prevent a licensee from breaching the terms of their contract? Who would like to answer that one first? Um, I can take that. So uh, as I mentioned that uh, every licensing agreement is unique and it has its own uh, terms and conditions. Uh, it's extremely important to have a written agreement. The terms will essentially govern um, the conduct of the parties. The terms can mention uh, the remedies in case of a uh, breach of a license. And the terms of the agreement can also mention any dispute resolution uh, mechanisms. So essentially the remedies in case of a breach could be uh, getting damages or um, revocation of the license or uh, you know, a court order that stops the licensee from continuing the breach. Perfect. David's asking how to protect my IP in various countries around the world. Do I need to apply in many countries at once? And he's thinking, is this expensive? Versus going in some sequence once we know that a patent is likely to be granted in an initial country. So that's a great question. And uh, usually what is done is depending on the resources of the business, you are seeking to uh, protect your IP first in the market that you are initially targeting. And once you have that going and you're thinking about expanding, um, that's where you're going to want to think about uh, uh, 
protecting your IP in, in different countries because, uh, you know, as, as David mentioned, it is quite expensive. There are uh, sort of international uh, patent organizations like the World International uh, Patent Organization that you can seek an, an international patent for, but um, that is usually down the line. First of all, you're going to want to protect your IP in, in the country where uh, you are uh, seeking to, to market your IP. Awesome. Thanks, Joaquin. And David, we are, our next week's session is actually going to be covering all of that. Um, so make sure you tune in. We're going to put a link in the chat um, shortly so you can sign up for that because um, that's going to be a great conversation. I know there's going to be many questions surrounding that as well. Uh, the next question we have is how much time does it take to franchise a business? I know that's definitely a, a common question that we get. Um, so maybe if one of you guys would like to take a stab at that. Yeah, right. so, uh, sorry, Joaquin, you want to oh, Please take ahead. it away. Uh, so um, I think it's uh, difficult to have a set timeline on how long it'll take to franchise your business. It really depends uh, on what your business is, how complicated it is, what stage you're at. So um, uh, as mentioned in the presentation, it's important to conduct a feasibility study. It's important that you have a pilot unit in the market that you want to, you know, expand in or like a similar market so that you know that your, um, so that you know that your franchise would be successful to some level. Um, and then, of course, it's important to uh, have a written agreement and also uh, launch a network of marketing uh, and all those things take time. So, for example, we had the example of McDonald's. We know that it's a huge corporation and they have their set up in place. So it, they, it'll take them less time to open up a new franchise compared to someone who's uh, just started. Um, and Joaquin, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, just adding on from the McDonald's example, they started their first restaurant in 1948 and they started their franchise in 1953. So it took them around five years. And essentially you can start franchising uh, when you can get people that want to become part of your franchise, if you can attract franchisees, if you have a successful business, and that's usually going to take uh, a bit of time. And so on that topic, what would be the benefit of franchising your own business? Um, I think there are several benefits of franchising, the most important being the initial capital investment. Um, in, in, in case of franchising, it is the franchisee that puts in the capital. Uh, and so uh, there's less risk uh, in terms of debt for the franchisor. And additionally, because the franchisee is so involved, uh, it's likely that they will pay attention to uh, the day-to-day -day running of the business. So uh, it's good to have um, that uh, surety in, uh, instead of relying on some external uh, management. And I think also it's a faster way to grow your business and expand uh, into new markets. Sorry, uh, just to add on to that, uh, another benefit could just be having someone else make your trademarks used in a different geographical region that you yourself probably wouldn't have gone to yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of trademark protections are based on geographic region and whether it was actually used. Uh, so yeah, franchising can be an excellent way for you to expand the markets that your marks are used in. Awesome, thanks, David. I mean, on that topic, as somebody else is asking, um, how much does it cost to get a trademark? And then what would be the timeline for registering one trademark? Uh, I can take that one. Um, so the government is actually, the Canadian government is very good with posting this sort of information. Uh, so that's exactly what I did. I just went to that website. Uh, and here it says the application for registering a trademark is around $336. Um, and just remember that trademarks are registered in association with specific goods or services, and you have to list what those goods and services are when you res register your mark. Uh, so the fees are actually proportional to that. Um, so the number I just gave you is just for like one class of goods or services, and then each additional class after that costs like $100 extra. And in terms of the timeline, again, the government websites, uh, if you just Google uh, Canadian uh, performance targets for uh, IP, then you should be able to pull up information based on 
different categories of IP. Uh, for trademarks, it seems to be a lot faster than other categories like patents. Um, so if I just read off of what I'm seeing here, it says um, registering a trademark for electronic application. Uh, they try to get it done within five business days upon receipt of the electronic request. What if someone is already using a trademark as an unregistered mark, um, which this person has registered for? Well, the once you start using a mark, you have what is called a, a common law trademark, right? Um, so, uh, so that's something that eventually you're going to want to get registered officially, and and that's uh, going to take uh, around thirteen to eighteen months. Um, um, if, if you're going to uh, go through the, the, if you're going to want to do it in the United States, the United States uh, Patent Trade Office. But as long as you start using it, you have a common law trademark, right? But it, that's going to be a lot more difficult to defend than an, a registered mark. How does a startup counter the threat of rogue companies who file for a trademark in another country and then intend to use the registration as a means to extort the startup into buying or licensing their own mark for overseas use? Uh, I think this is quite similar to the previous question. It's about what, like, what would you do as a startup if someone else tried to use your mark somewhere else? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I just want to go back into the point that trademarks are usually uh, protected based on the regions or the geographic regions you used it in. Uh, so it can be quite expensive, but I think the best way to uh, defend yourself in that sort of situation is just make sure that your trademark is actually used or, or registered or at least used in whatever regions you're concerned about. Uh, and again, we're, we're only students who can't give legal advice, uh, but it seems that the unfortunate, unfortunate situation is if other people are using your mark in an area where you've never used your mark or registered your mark, uh, it can lead to a pretty difficult legal dispute. Okay. Perfect, thanks David. And we have about two more questions here. So feel free if anybody has anything that they wanna get out, um, students are here to answer all questions that you have. So. Um, how can the clinic actually help with franchising or filing the patent or trademark? So uh, what the clinic does more than anything is carry out patent searches and trademark searches. And so with regards to franchising, uh, you're going to want to have a trademark. And so uh, what the clinic can do is students in collaboration with lawyers at Braskin and Parr or Norton Rose Fulbright, can go over and do a trademark search and see if the, there might be marks that are associated with the mark that you are, are trying to trademark. And so um, once you have that information and maybe you find out that there is already sort of a very similar trademark, you might not want to proceed with a trademark lawyer, but um, otherwise you, you might want to. So it can give you a good idea of whether you're going to be uh, contracting a, a lawyer and going forward. And we, we also do a patent searches. And so if you have an innovation and you want to get an idea of whether it's unique, because uh, being novel is, is one of the criteria that, that you need uh, in order to, to patent your innovation, you're going to want to go to the clinic and see if there might be anything else that might already have been registered. That, uh, because uh, again, if something was already registered, that, 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 is, that is your idea, it might be more difficult for you to pursue um, a patent. How many trademarks can you register in a year? Is there a limit? Is there, Tanya? I'm not 100% uh, sure, but I, I don't think uh, there's a limit to the number of trademarks that you could register in a year. As David mentioned, you're, you're paying uh, $330 and, and then $100 for every subclass. So uh, I guess the limit might be how much you're willing to spend on, on, getting, uh, on getting trademarks, but totally. yeah, can't be. Yeah, and, and just keep in mind that uh, if you register a bunch of trademarks just to be safe, but then you never actually use some of them, um, someone else could uh, try to expunge your mark, which means like take it off the register because it, Canadian trademark law has a use it or lose it sort of mantra and um, it, the register won't keep like dead marks. Perfect, that's helpful. And Emma just added, you can file as many as you want. So that's perfect. 
Um, and our last question we have here um, is, I have, a, I have my, domain main, my domain name registered, do I need to trademark it? Yeah, I think uh, a trademark registration is separate from a domain name registration. A domain name will protect um, your domain name and not necessarily uh, your mark for use on your product or services. So um, I think uh, you should also register your trademark in addition to your domain name. Well, thank you guys. If you have anything you'd like to add, I think that kind of concludes our Q&A here. If anybody else has any last minute questions, feel free to quickly pop them in there and uh, we'd be happy to help. Um, but thank you for all the information you provided us today with team. I hope all of the attendees were able to take away some insights that could be and strategies that could be applied to your business. I wanted to thank again, Alex from Barristan Law for joining us today and for sponsoring the series. We definitely encourage you to join us next week, same time for part three of the IP Lunch Club, where mentioned before, we will be exploring the mechanics of filing a patent and patent law. The IP Osgood team will uncover the roadmap for filing a patent and the highlighted differences between patent regimes in Canada and the US. Uh, so I know my colleague Meg's going to put the link in the chat there. You can register right away by clicking the link. I noticed Emma has also um, put in links to the actual IP Innovation Clinic chatbot and website. So feel free to um, click on those. Like I mentioned, we will be sending out um, this recording and the resources mentioned today in a follow-up email to all of the attendees. So you can refer back to it as many times as you want. Um, but thank you again to everybody for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we will see you next week, hopefully. Thanks so much, everyone.